Dabo Sweeney made a comment after the game, uh, kind of drawing back toward uh, his ability to build the program and where they had come from, and not the Ashes, but a borderline top 25 program that would consistently win seven to eight games, but was an afterthought nationally to prominence and said that, hey, we did it, I did it. That proves anybody can do it. Legitimately, how many programs out there can win national championships? What are we talking? 15? I think you'd have to go conference by conference. Um, you know, we, we have some teams that are traditional, that are known for guys our age and older as traditional powers, like UCLA. And UCLA hasn't had a double digit win season this century. Uh, Texas AM, uh, I mean, Forbes, I think, listed them the most lucrative football program. Uh, in the sport back in September when they did their perennial, perennial survey. I think it was AM, Texas, Michigan, Alabama, and Ohio State. I think the top five in that order. AM has had one double digit win season since 1999, and that was uh, Johnny Manziel's Heisman season. Okay. So um, I, I think then we have to define what do you mean they can do it? What circumstances do they have to have? You know, I, I did this comparison between Michigan and Clemson uh, for. Uh, for the Michigan podcast website known as Wolverine Digest. And, and then I broke it down even more for this week's episode of, of Michigan podcast in greater detail to show when you look at everything that Clemson has. And Dabo's diagnosis of where his program was when he took over is accurate. Let me give, give your audience some numbers on, on Clemson. that just kind of blew me away. Oh, that's the dog. Uh, what is the dog's little, name? I'm curious. What's that? Is there a Michigan-related name for the dog? The dog's name is actually Captain America. The kids named him when they were little a few years okay. ago. Clemson didn't get to its first bowl game since 1939. Michigan claims eight national championships before that. Um, from, from 1936 to 1980, why do I say 36? Because that's when the AP poll started. Clemson had a total of two teams finishing the final top 10. Michigan had 24. Then they win the national championship with Homer Jordan in 1981, right? Come out of nowhere, win that. From 1982 to 2014, Clemson didn't finish higher than eighth in the AP poll. From 1982 to 2014, Michigan finished higher than eighth in the final AP poll 10 times. Okay? So there's a lot of truth to what he is saying. Now, one of the things that's helped is he has a massive demographic migration in the, that part of the country that didn't exist. In, in fact, I did this exercise uh, about a, a year ago looking for off-season content. And you know what I found? That really no sport in the country has been more impacted by demographic changes than college football. And, and the reason why is because you can't draft players. You have to recruit them. The most likely place you recruit them is in closer proximity. And, and unlike basketball, where Villanova gets a really good coach and can just recruit three great players a year, they can be a national power, you're going to put 22 guys on the field every Saturday in college football, Mark, as you well know. And if, if seven, eight, nine of those guys aren't any good, it won't matter how good the other 10, 11, 12 guys are. They'll, they'll get destroyed, right? So what I found was if you go back and look, you know, for example, um, the, you know, Iowa pre-flight, a dominant team uh, during the World War II era, uh, you know, the, the service academies in the early years of, of, of college football's national prominence, particularly from World War, post-World War I to post-World War II. Why? Well, we had two world wars. We had a, Viet we had a Korean War. We had three massive military buildups. And so that increase the talent uh, availability uh, to the service academies. Then you look at, you had the Rust Belt migration uh, post-World War II, and that's where you really saw programs, uh, it, well, in the 30s and the 40s. This is the industrial era and, and, uh, and the assembly line era, and you saw the, that's where the Big Ten uh, essentially was the AP, half the AP top 10 every year like the, like the SEC is now. You know, then you had the Western migration in the in the 50s and 60s when Ike put the freeway interstate system in. And that's where it's kind of funny. We talk about this in California now, but California kids used to be the low tax state that everybody moved to, not away from. 
right? And so it's no coincidence all of a sudden now John McKay and John Robinson in the 60s and 70s, USC is a perennial power. Dick Vermeil and Terry, uh, uh, um, I don't forget his last Donahue. name. Donahue, thank you. Build UCLA uh, into, a, into a national power. Uh, you know, they can't get every California kid, right? So Don James turns Washington into a national power. And the West, it's, it, and, and when you and I were growing up, it was like the Big Ten was never going to win a Rose Bowl ever again because of what we talked about, right? And, and the Southeastern Conference was, was really an inbred conference. And what I mean by that is it was, it was largely loved by the people that lived there. It was like a regional wrestling you know, company. It, it, you know, it, it, it was. It, it, it. They were in their own little shell. But outside of when, outside of Bear Bryant, they were rarely a nationally relevant conference. Well, that's changed in the last twenty-five years. You've seen right-to-work laws sweep the Southeast and the Atlantic Coast. We've seen a mass mass migration, and a lot. Several of those states have gotten rid of their state income taxes or severely reduced them. And and now that migration that went out west in the sixties and seventies. In the 90s and 2000s has now gone to the southeast and the Atlantic coast. And voila, now we're seeing the amount of talent in the 2017 NFL draft. More players, that high, former high school players, were drafted from the state of Georgia than any other state. That would not have happened even 10 years ago. We're talking more than Florida. We're talking more than Texas. We're talking more than California. We're talking more than Ohio. You know, And so... Uh, now, and so when, when we talk about which teams can do this now, you either have to have that, that parochial recruiting base or you need a national brand so that you can go get players just about anywhere, you know? And so when I look at the Big Ten, Ohio State kind of has the best of both worlds. The state of Ohio is not what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago where John Cooper just go out and get the Ohio Dream Team and go 10-2 and two every year just by you know rolling helmets out. There's not that much talent left, but it's still the best talent state in our region. Um, and now they have a national brand. It's, it's, you, I, could, and I hate to say this as a Michigan fan, because we've kind of been the national brand of the conference since its inception. But when you look at television ratings, Ohio State's now right there with us. And in some years, they actually draw more viewers than we do. All right, so they kind of have the best of both worlds. Michigan remains right there with the Notre Dame amongst the great national brands. They can go into any living room anywhere. Uh, in any state and, uh, and and have a kid listen to them if they have a, you know, a coach with full motor function. And then after that, when you look at the Big Ten, I don't know, can Penn State still do that? I, I don't know. Now, Pennsylvania is still a very talented t state, not again where it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, I don't know. We, I don't know that we fully know what the Sandusky scandal did to them as a national brand. You know, I, I don't know. Um, they're good. I would suspect the answer is more likely they could win a national championship than not, given that they've actually been more competitive against Ohio State in the Big Ten than Michigan has. And then after that, I don't, you know, there's 11 other teams in our league. I, I don't think any of them, as the system currently stands, could win a national championship. And so I think we'd have to look at all five power five leagues the way we just did the Big Ten. Who has the, the native recruiting base? And if they don't have that, do they have enough of a national presence? Like I would argue, I know it sounds nuts to probably the most people. I think Stanford has a better chance to win a national championship than a Washington, for example, because they have a national brand. Um, and, and so I think if you had a really good coach there, and I think they, they do right now, I, I think it would be more possible for Stanford to win a national championship uh, than, a, than a school like Washington who's actually been to the playoff to win the national championship versus getting to the college football playoff. And for a lot of the teams that we're talking about who could be on the fringe of that, that's a leap. That is a gigantic leap. Take Iowa in 2015. So as I was asking the question, Iowa popped into my mind from 2015 mm -hmm. in which they had the perfect road. The stars aligned. They didn't have to play anyone difficult in the Big Ten East. They went undefeated. Nebraska down. Wisconsin decent, but uh, the, the division lined up for them. They're 12-0. They play a Michigan State team that is not overwhelmingly talented. A better team that didn't play well that night. Therefore, Iowa had a chance, but they didn't get the job done. But even if they win that game, they're 13-0. They get to the playoff to get through two of those behemoths that they would have had to face is just like saying you got to win the next 40 consecutive games. Yes. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think they would have lost Alabama even worse than Michigan State did. And that was a great year for the University of Iowa. But it, but remember who they lost to in the Rose Bowl? Yeah, they lost to Stanford and got Christian a blue. McCaffrey and Stanford. <laughs> you know, and I, I think the team that Jim had uh, his last year at Stanford with Andrew Luck could have won uh, a, a college football playoff. Um, I think the team that Stanford had a couple of years ago, McCaffrey's sophomore year, could have won potentially a college football playoff. And the re- and because Stanford's national identity, and it's why they have a national identity. You know, like I don't think Stanford and Notre Dame can be elite at the same time. And and what you've seen is as Stanford's kind of gone to Stanford's lost three games or more three of the last four years, and now we've and it's not a coincidence. Stanford's had five lost seasons two of the last three years, Mark. And this is the first time in a quarter century since the pinnacle of the Holtz era that Notre Dame that Notre Dame has won double digit games consecutive years. They haven't done it in 25 years. I don't think it's a coincidence. Why? Because Notre Dame doesn't sell its Catholic identity to recruits like it did in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s when you know the, that was a major recruiting boost for them. They sell more of their elite private academic status now, and they're recruiting a lot of the same elite four, high fours, five-star guys that, that Stanford is. So uh, there's only so many of those guys that are that good and then want to go to a school that is that, to an elite private academic school that will make them not just student athletes, but real students at the same time. There's only so many of those guys across the country nowadays that I don't think there's enough for Notre Dame and Stanford to be on the, to be nationally competitive and relevant at the same time. It's one or the other. We've got Steve Dace on the line from Michigan podcast. So if you go to any of your favorite audio channels, you can find Michigan podcast or just check him out on YouTube and uh, you get to see his uh, pearly whites.